joining us. Next, we have uh, another very exciting keynote this morning uh, with Jonah Preddy and Ben Smith. Jonah is known for creating viral hits, tracking online social behavior, and building technology to amplify buzz. He is co-founder of the Huffington Post, and more recently, BuzzFeed, a network with over 12 million unique visitors a month. He's been called a viral marketing hot dog by the New York Times, the poster boy of Guerrilla Media by Alternet, and a computer whiz by The New Yorker. This past October, Fast Company Media named Jonah one of the new faces of social media. Jonah is a graduate of the MIT Media Lab and has taught at NYU and Parsons School of Design. His work has been covered by Time, The Economist, Fortune, and Business Insider, and he's appeared as a guest on the Today Show, Good Morning America, and CNN. Joining him is Ben Smith, who joined BuzzFeed as editor-in-chief in January 2012. Prior to BuzzFeed, Ben was senior political writer for Politico from 2007 to 2011, where he wrote a daily blog that Time magazine named as one of the five essential blogs in 2010. In 2008, Ben covered the Democratic presidential primary with a focus on Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. B before Politico, he wrote a column and a blog for the New York Daily News, and he also started New York's first political blog, The Politicker for the New York Observer, as well as the political site Room 8 after working as City Hall Bureau Chief for the New York Sun. Ben appears regularly on MSNBC and CNN and was called one of the most talented and admired scoop mongers in the game by the New Republic, named one of Fast Company's most creative people in business and featured in Fortune's 40 Under 40. Please join me in welcoming Ben and Jonah to the stage. Oh, we gotta come up. Here, I'll let you go on the, over here. <laughs> Hello, um, so Ben and I have a lot of awkward conversations in private, and so we thought today we could have one in public. Um, it, and so uh, I want to start. Really, what? <laughs> I want to start by, um, by just uh, saying that, um, you know, BuzzFeed had a, this remarkable transformation um, uh, about a year and a half or two years ago when Ben joined the company. Um, at the time we were in denial and we thought we were a tech company um, that didn't have uh, really much investment in editorial. And um, somehow we convinced Ben to, to join and people's view, was, uh, pe people's view of it was why is this respected journalist who other journalists really love um, coming to a site that posts pictures of cute kittens and internet memes and web culture. Um, and it's been, um, but, but uh, three days after joining, uh, Ben got the scoop that John McCain was um, endorsing Mitt Romney. And at first... Uh, it, an event of world historic import in retrospect. Well, well so what, it, it was our first, it, it wasn't the most, the biggest scoop that you've uh, ever had. And it wasn't such an important scoop, but it was our first scoop as a company. So you remember your first time. Um, and. Um, and at first, uh, CNN reported half an hour later that, 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 that uh, McCain was endorsing Romney and didn't credit us. And what was amazing was that Twitter exploded with people saying, why are you crediting BuzzFeed Ben? This story is, a, uh, is a, um, you know, something that they got. And I think CNN was thinking, wait, that, that web culture and cute animal site, we have to credit? Um, but they, they immediately kind of reversed course and congratulated us on the scoop. And from that point forward, we've been um, breaking um, a, you know, news and um, had reporters on Romney's plane and, and uh, uh, Michael Hastings traveling with the Obama campaign, launched a bunch of other verticals. Um, and it's been a, a, a big transformation for the company. So I guess my, my first question is, you know, to, for, for Ben is, well, you know, why did you, why did, what made you think that you could come and like break news on a site that didn't ever have news on it? Great question. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, my own sort of background in, was in really, you know, straight ahead political reporting. And when Jonah first approached me with all this jargon about the social web, I did not like immediately know what he was talking about. <laughs> um, but I think if you were particularly a political reporter, I think, because politics is, is a business of communications and often, often those guys are, are the first to adopt, adapt some, some of these new tools. You, 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 at least for me, I was writing a blog in 2008 and just felt, which was very fun and, and very intense, 
And then you know, around the time of the healthcare fight in 2009, you could just feel the life get sucked out of the blogosphere and move over to Twitter. And, and, all, and, and all of the fights that you'd been having on blogs, and fighting on blogs was really fun, but really inconvenient, because when you attacked someone, you had to copy the link and send it to them and say, hey, I attacked you. I hope you'll, you'll attack me back. And also, please link me, <laughs> link me above the attack, if possible, rather than below. Um, and, and Twitter just centralized that whole conversation that was happening in an incredibly effective way. And when I kind of, and, 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 when, and when I guess I sort of started looking at what BuzzFeed had been doing, and particularly at this obsession with what people share, I, I kind of realized that a lot of what beat reporters in particular had already begun to do was obsess about the same stuff. And to think about, you know, how, uh, to think about how is this story going to travel on Twitter? Why are people going to share this? And it's going to be because it's a scoop, or because it's incredibly smart, or because it's funny, or, or because in some way it adds something to the conversation. It doesn't aggregate. It doesn't repeat. And that was. And I think if you were obsessing about Twitter and and how to make news work on Twitter, it made a lot of sense to to, to join a place that was equally obsessed with with sharing. So the. This McCain scoop and other political scoops in your first few months of BuzzFeed mostly traveled because of Twitter and your following on Twitter. People weren't coming to BuzzFeed looking for political news initially, um, but Twitter had really become the starting point for political junkies, and so that was you know, a way to, to reach them. And, and it, it didn't matter so much when they clicked through um, where they were landing so long as they trusted the source and, and, and they saw it in their Twitter stream. Um, what we saw when the, um, the Boston bombing happened was that the news broke first on Twitter. So immediately there were people on the scene tweeting that they heard an explosion. And um, I was looking at BuzzFeed's live stats when this happened. And I saw the front page of BuzzFeed um, um, immediately surge in traffic before we had even posted anything. So we hadn't even posted anything about it. It wasn't that we had great content. It was literally seconds after this news started to break. Um, and people were coming to us for news. Um, what, what, you know, how, how, did, how did you respond to it? Did you deliver to, the, to that audience that was coming to news? Was it a little bit, uh, you know, it, it feels to me like a big difference that it's not just about doing great stuff that is shared on the social web. It's about people actually coming to us looking for coverage. These are like incredible softball questions. Um, <laughs> All but, right, I'm going to ask you really yeah, tough questions next gotta, time. Um, but the, um, <laughs> but I guess the, um, I mean, yeah, I think for us, we'd spent a lot of time thinking about and spent the last year really thinking about how to break news into these little kind of atoms that travel on Twitter. And, and, and the thing about, about doing that is that you assume that Twitter is the context, that you have an audience for tech news, for fashion news, for political news that's living on Twitter. You have editors who are important voices in that space. But honestly, it matters less who's tweeting it than what the content is. If, it's, if it is something new, it'll sell itself. And, People, and people will share it with their friends who trust them. Um, but, but what we've also found about, about huge breaking news stories, like Boston, like the Sandy Hook massacre before that, not, not only horrible things, but often, often crime stories, in which they have historically always been a total mess. The reporting around any major disaster is a total shit show for the first like five hours. And anybody who's been in a, in a newsroom you know, knows that you're sending reporters out to the wrong guy's house. You're, You've got all these wrong names. You're wasting huge amounts of time chasing down bad leads. In the old days, that stuff didn't reflect outside the newsroom. It was just happening in the newsroom. Often it was happening on TV, but nobody was tweeting about all the crazy stuff that anchors were saying in the first five hours of a news event. So it's sort of been forgotten that it was such a mess. But now that, that messy process is totally public on Twitter. You're seeing all the sources that reporters are trying to chase down as they're chasing them down. You're getting people tweeting police scanners, which are a great source for reporters, and reporters are always listening to and obsessing about police scanners. But it's also like 50 different cops saying whatever comes to mind, joking, talking in police slang. It's incredibly easy to, to get it wrong. It's certainly not the sort of thing that you would, you know, with, with several hours to report out and confirm, stick in your newspaper. And so in a way, the process of, of day-to-day like -day news, which is about finding things that will advance this fairly kind of coherent, insane story on Twitter gets totally flipped when there are these big news events and everybody's obsessed. And the challenge is to get on your own website and, and to, create, to create something that, act, that, that explains and contextualizes all of, this, um, all of this information that's flying all over the place, maybe 50% of which is accurate, 50% is wrong. And you have to be really transparent with your readers about saying, 
you know, here's something we know to be false. And in fact, that's often just as useful as saying to people, here's something we know to be true. I think during Hurricane Sandy, our most widely, our most widely shared post was, um, was here are nine images that are not of Hurricane Sandy. Because, you know, images, images of, you know, images from Planet of the Apes with the Empire State Building underwater were going viral. Um, maybe not exactly that one. And so, I don't know, and so the news or, your, your role as a news organization is to kind of be a sophisticated participant in that conversation, to put stuff in context, to tell people what of the information they're seeing is true, what's false, and what's, you know, and what you know about information that itself has become part of the story but you're not sure about yet. And I think that's a big challenge that everybody's kind of trying to figure out how to handle ambiguous information that is itself everywhere, that is itself become part of the story. You want harder questions? Is that what you're after? Yeah, yeah. Tougher questions. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, what would be the toughest question I could possibly ask you? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, so, so BuzzFeed, part of, one of the ideas behind BuzzFeed is that you're making content for, this, for sharing. That you're making content that you know, people will tweet or post on Facebook. Um, doesn't, um, doesn't that give the, the people sharing the content too much power? What if, they sh you know, if there's an important news story and you report it and you cover it and it's something that people don't find, it's, you know, it's not about arrested development and it isn't about some massive breaking news story, um, doesn't that, um, you know, it doesn't get shared that much, that doesn't make the story any less important. It might be an even more important story, but, but the fact that people aren't sharing it shows the masses don't like, like, don't care about it, but it's actually a really important story for democracy, important for journalism. Um, so like, don't you pander too much to, to the audience of people sharing content? Yeah, I think that's, like, that is totally a, a challenge. Um, and yeah, when the, when the suits upstairs are just saying, just make things to share. <laughs> and, you know, but, and, but, but fortunately, you're good, good reporters often push in the other direction, which is that if, particularly if, if you're a beat reporter, if you're covering a story, you, you, you are gonna, you're going to wind up often maybe writing 10, 10 incremental stories that nobody reads to get to a big story that will break out that people will read. And you have to have a certain level of confidence that, that, you're, that you're getting somewhere interesting. I do think there are also pressures that I think we mostly resist, but that everybody's feeling in media that, that change. You know, in, in the nightly news, it was if it bleeds, it leads. And tabloid newspapers, again, like horrific crimes often lead because people have this kind of, kind of can't tear their eyes away. Um, and often good news stories, stories about structural change, you know, that this is an old complaint about journalism, don't get covered because, in exchange, because of the sensationalism. Um, the, so I think actually the social web has like its own set of, of pressures that are different. Like I think often, it's almost the reverse. Like stories that say stories that are good news stories that tell a kind of systematic story about how how you two can change the world, which are the sort of thing the old media weren't accused of covering. I think the social web kind of favors them sometimes to a fault. Like the Stop Coney video was a great example of this, where here was this video that told a kind of linear and inspiring story about how you two could make change in this really brutal Central African conflict. It turns out that it was actually promoting, like the, the local, the regional governments actually thought, you know, maybe this would have been helpful five years ago, but now we have the problem in hand and we don't actually want American soldiers running around the jungle. But it was too late. This video had actually, I mean, apparently the, the American commander in that region now has a Stop Coney poster tacked to his door. And there's a pretty good argument that this produced like a terrible policy outcome because it was, because it was geared toward basically this incentive of people wanting to share it. Um, and, 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 there, and certainly there's no, um, people share in the same way that often they consume media that reflects what they want to know. There, there are charts about who's responsible for the deficit that um, you'll see on Facebook, either that Obama is 100% responsible or that George W. Bush is 100% responsible, and you cannot kill these things, no matter how many times you write that they're total bullshit. You know, they, they just keep circulating and circulating. Well, why, do, why don't you make stuff like that? It gets shared a lot. Um, you know, I guess you, you, that's, that's a good question. I think there would be some pure commercial incentive just to pander to your audience. Um, by the way, what, what is your political leanings? But I'm, I'm very neutral and wishy-washy. This is finally getting good. <laughs> um, but so, so I, mean, I mean, does that mean that you have political views but you just conceal them? Or, or you actually don't have political views? 
I think I have political <laughs> views and conceal them, but they also aren't, are often not very deeply felt. But sometimes there are, and I conceal them. But I'll, I mean, like you were just pointing out, a lot of things that get shared widely are things that take a very strong kind of pol political view, so that everyone who agrees with them clicks the like button on Facebook and shares them. And and even though those things get a huge amount of traffic, you know, we we haven't done many of those. You know, I know and by we I mean I know. I think you might be okay with it actually. Um, give, just guessing, given your, your background at the Huffington Post. But um, I don't know, I think, I think there's this balance between credibility and, um, I mean, I think, I think that often you can, you can pander to an, your audience by telling them what they want to hear in a way that eats away at your credibility in the long term. And also, journalistically, means that, you, that people you're trying to cover accurately don't view you as an honest broker. And I think it's very hard to, um, to pretend like, I think it's very hard to, um, like, people aren't idiots. Subjects of stories aren't idiots. And, and, when, you're, and, when, you, and when you are fundamentally not being, um, when you're fundamentally out to get them, even if, you're, even if there's kind of a veneer of fairness and accuracy and journalistic standards, people see through that. And, and, in the, and conversely, when you're doing things that are formally different and feel new, as we are, but you're fundamentally being fair, people, I think, feel that. So a lot of, a lot of, People writing about journalism today like to say that the idea of a neutral voice, uh, you know, objective voice, um, was always a fiction. That you you can't actually be, you can't actually just report on something in a totally fair, neutral way that everyone has their bias, and that you what you should do is ex is disclose your bias as part of your writing. And so you see, like the Ezra Klein's of the world, you know, saying, "Oh, I'm a pro I'm a sort of centrist progressive, and here's sort of what I believe in." And here's and sometimes they go against their own view in a particular piece, but but they're kind of trying to be transparent about their bias. You've tended to take the approach of, you know, going after new information, going after scoops, going after after stories without what anyone really being able to tell, like what you're. You know, yeah, I mean, I think that's. I think it's totally legitimate, to be honest, to to, to have to be coming from somewhere, to be honest about it, to 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 allow the facts to change your mind and to let that happen in public. Um, that seems like a really legitimate way to go after it. Certainly, it's it is hard to cover people who don't think you'll be fair to them. I mean, that's just a reality. So why has BuzzFeed, um, which hasn't really taken any strong political stands, been so so um, celebratory with things like like marriage equality? I do think there's a there you know and this is every news organization is going to make these these calls and to me marriage equality actually isn't is, is I don't think there are really that many things like it but I think um, it, to some degree it's a generational issue but I think there there are issues that slip between being issues of um, uh, between between being seen as political issues and and up for debate and being seen as sort of civil rights issues, issues of fairness that aren't. Like, you know, like you, nobody expects the New York Times. Isn't civil rights just a left-wing thing? <laughs> now, you, now you're just trolling me. Um, well, you said I wasn't asking tough questions. No, no, this I, is better. I, I, I have, this is actually kind of interesting. The, um, I do think with marriage equality, like it's, it, it, it's one of the, like the New York Times does not cover the, the, the um, doesn't cover racists fairly, right? I don't think anybody in the media does. In the, <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say it quite that way. I mean, I think I think people don't people don't don't view don't I and mean, I don't think that people whose views are like for favor racial supremacy are entitled to a fair airing of those views. Like right. those are discredited views that aren't part, that really aren't part of a legitimate conversation. Right, but and I think and I think the people, people on the left are more into civil rights. That's the non-trolling way to say it. They spend more there. I you? mean, I guess if you don't consider speech a civil right, that's certainly true. <laughs> speech a civil right? You mean? No, I, mean, right? I don't know. I think. People disagree on definitions I mean, yeah, of civil rights. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, in a bro broadly defined, marriage equality is about civil rights and isn't a part. Yeah, but I, mean, I think in our view, we've sort of shifted that issue more into a category like, like civil rights around issues of race. That you know that it, that isn't something where there are two sides having a debate that we're not you know and and more like, and and more that there's a sort of a basic issue of fairness that's pretty core to kind of who we are as a news organization. Yeah, so, so for me, Ben Smith has been very refreshing. <laughs> I like to refer to him as full name when I'm <laughs> talking to him. Um, in the sense that, you know, I, I never had done anything in business. I worked at, a, at, at a, doing research and running an R&D lab. And um, Huffington Post was something that I, I did largely for political reasons. You know, when I met Ken Lair and, and Ariana and, 
like the idea of starting a company wasn't something I really cared about. I didn't want to start a company. I think that kind of entrepreneurship at the time, especially, I thought was kind of overrated. Like, why is it so cool to, to like start a company and make money? Like, that's sort of not, you know, like, like that's not sort of the best values to be like, you know, look how rich this person is or how big this company is. Um, but after having Bush in office for so many years and being and seeing the the sort of net roots and trying to elect Howard Dean with like the idea that just like speaking truth to power and like you know everyone can be participating is going to cause a change and we're going to have Howard Dean as president and seeing how poorly that worked and how little savvy they had about how to um, actually have an impact on 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 electoral outcomes and on politics. Yeah. Starting Huffington Post was pretty appealing. It was like, okay, like if we could build something where Drudge is over here on the on the right and there's nothing on the left, and if we could build something that would be influential on the web that would help a Democrat get elected, um, that's pretty exciting. But then after doing that for a while and actually having a Democrat get elected, um, you know, more and more, uh, you know, just reading sort of. Uh, <clears throat> the kind of sh shrill left-wing comments that would like be on every single post and seeing the way people would share content just because it, they, it agreed with them, even if it was a poorly reasoned piece, like a poorly reasoned piece you agreed with, you'd share with everyone you, know, you knew, and a, and a like, and a like well-reasoned piece that kind of challenged your views, like you wouldn't share and wouldn't go anywhere. I started to get kind of um, um, like overdose on the kind of lefty Kool-Aid. And, and it became like this effort in making content of like you're triangulating between these different views to, and, and, and not thinking so much about breaking a story, but thinking about how that story is positioned in this ideological universe. So working with you has been, um, um, and, and what, has been refreshing in the sense that I just see you get on as something where you're trying to like figure out what is going on and you get information the public doesn't know and then you publish that information and sometimes it hurts people on the left or on the right or on one cause or another cause but it's like getting information the public doesn't know and showing it, sharing it with the public and that is kind of um, refreshing and pure in a way that um, wasn't my initial experience in media but but uh, I'm really enjoying right and now. What, um, and what got you into the uh, making money and becoming rich part? <laughs> that was sort of accidental. <laughs> But are you, I, you do seem to enjoy like the well, well, getting side. yeah, getting the business. I mean, once you know, um, seeing as Huffington Post started to grow as a business, that got addicted. Not so much for the money side, but just that 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 um, as a company generates revenue or gets more investment, you can grow it and do more things and hire more people. And you know, now like just thinking about what what all the things that we can do at BuzzFeed now because. We generate so much revenue, and you know th that we, you know, we're hiring foreign correspondents, and we're, um, you know, have an office in the UK now. That you know, we're building a social video studio in in, in Los Angeles, um, and we're able to invest in really great hiring, great people to do really awesome work. That's hard to do if you're a small nonprofit or something that that it, you know doesn't have a way of of generating revenue to, to grow. So I did get addicted to the sense that you could create an, an interesting business and that that structure was a good way of of aligning people and getting people excited and attracting really great people. Another, I guess, something I'm interested to ask you. Um, from you, I think you were known then. I mean, and always a little bit of as sort of a genius at, about traffic, and at Huffington Post, traffic was among the many things that just kind of scaled up incredibly fast. And I wonder like, what's changed in the way you think about traffic since, I don't know, over the years. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, that um, partly because at the Huffington Post, my role was more focused on traffic and you know, product tech than traffic, really. Um, you know, I got very obsessed with it. Like, how do you grow? How do you make the numbers go up? It was like a game, you know? It's like, how do you keep growing this thing and getting it bigger and bigger? I think as I've gotten older and I've been in doing this stuff for longer, you start to realize that it, like, it's possible to over-optimize. It's possible to have uh, too much traffic. And, and by that, I mean, if you are able to get someone to see a piece of content that doesn't want to see it, um, that makes your unique visitor number go up, but it actually isn't a good experience and it isn't good for your brand. So, you know, if you do a Google search and land on a page and, it, and the page is, um, is, doesn't, is, is not the authoritative page and you have to do another two or three clicks to get to the authoritative page, you just kind of anger people and it's not good for your brand. And so I think that um, there's lots of things that give you a short-term traffic hit, but long-term aren't good for building a business. Slideshows are another example. If you get obsessed with page views, 
you put slideshows and then all of a sudden your page views go way up and you're like, we've doubled our page views in two months and you get all excited and you don't realize that that page view is actually just an annoying experience of someone like clicking, you know, and, 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 and it isn't actually, you know, adding that much value. So I think like, I, I feel like there's lots of local maximums where you can optimize for traffic and you get to, you think you're at a, at a top because you're at a peak here, but actually there's some other mountain over here that's much taller and it takes a little longer to get there, but it's, it's a higher mountain. Um, you know, like, like um, when you think about um, things like salacious content or like, you know, you know, celebrities in bikinis or things like that, if you optimize based on clicks, those things get huge amounts of clicks. But it's a black hole because people then don't share those things, particularly on social web. And, and it, it becomes something that gives you short-term traffic and clicks and engagement, but it actually makes people feel a little dirty and want to take a shower and doesn't actually, you know, grow your traffic long-term. When we were, I guess when we probably would have had this conversation a year ago, we, we, I think we like had various theoretical conversations about what it would be to have a news organization without a front page and like purely distributed content. Has your thinking on that changed? Yeah, so we, you know, the, the idea was that social is the starting point. People would discover BuzzFeed content in Facebook, in Twitter, in Re on Reddit, on all these other social sites, and you wouldn't actually need to go to the front page of BuzzFeed. And then what we noticed was that the front page of BuzzFeed's traffic kept growing and growing and growing, and now it's like growing at it's a sort of ridiculous rate where people are coming to our front page. And in the example I cited earlier about Boston, people were coming for breaking news. Um, we also never really focused on demographics, but looking at our traffic, at, at like Comscore data now, we see that the majority of our, of our audience is 18 to 34 year olds, and they're coming to the front page. So what does that mean? They're supposed to be all on the social platforms and not coming to the front page of, of sites. Um, but the behavior we're seeing on the front page is different. It's, it's, it's not like, um, you know, what we built at Huffington Post where people were coming to get, you know, where, where when I thought of the front page of Huffington Post, I thought of how do you give someone everything they need? So there's a little of this, a little of that, and it's a one-stop shop for a, a person. The front page of BuzzFeed is much more about finding things to share with your friends. And so the front page even has a social function, which is I'm going to go look for something and the fact that there's a lot of things on the front page that I don't like is, is actually better <laughs> because, because I can not choose those things and I can choose something that fits my identity, that, fits, that inspires me, or not even that inspires me, but that my, I know my friend will like. I had like, you know, a guy tell me, I don't love the cute animal, I don't like the cute animal stuff, but my girlfriend loves it. So I go to BuzzFeed, find cute animal stuff, and send it to her, and then she writes back, oh, I love that. Um, you know, or, um, and, and, and so people aren't just looking for content for themselves. People have become publishers of content on the social web, and they're looking for places to discover things that they want to share and pass along um, with, with other people. Should we take a couple questions? Sure, we can take a couple questions. I think we Maybe, have time for a couple of questions. We can get the questions um, going. Um, and and yeah. um, one, one, um, one other thing that I think is, is kind of a surprise is um, seeing the way that um, that it's not just about user-generated content, particularly pe um, people, you know, sometimes people ask me, like, why would you have a, a highly paid professional like Ben Smith leading a ma major team at BuzzFeed of other pe people who are, you know, um, well compensated reporters, when you could just have the community and users upload everything and, and, and have um, a model where as your site grew, the content would just be submitted in, uh, to, to users. And that model, particularly in Silicon Valley, but also a few notable New York companies, have been, has been really favorable among investors because it sort of feels like a free lunch. Um, you know, you can, you can get all this content, you don't have to pay for any of the content. And I think that um, what we've seen is that, is that as these networks have been built out, the Twitters and the Facebooks and all these networks for sharing content, um, that trick is getting a little old of just sharing, you know, user-generated content. And our team, like even, even, you know, and not, not just reporters, but our team that makes entertaining content and lists and, 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 and things that are funny and humorous and cute and all, you know, they're better than the average user on the web. And the stuff they make gets shared more and gets passed around at a higher rate. 
And so um, I think there's a pretty exciting time now for both for reporting and entertainment, original entertainment content on the web because these networks are built out and what's the stakes now are what are people going to share on them and the quality of the stuff that people are, are, are sharing on them is going to keep going up and up and up and that's going to take people who really know what, they, what they're doing as well as, as user generated content. Yeah, I think I mean I know another way of putting it is the space has just become, like these are very transparent and very, very competitive spaces. And so if you're beating everybody, you know, with reporting or with amazing lists of animals, you can probably get a job doing it. And the best people, and you know, we're trying to like employ the best people at it. It's very, very competitive. The odds that somebody who's doing it part time will beat all those folks are low. Though it often happens as well. Yep. Questions? We got some questions here. We have nine minutes and forty-four seconds. So you've been in, in the newsroom before and you know when um, ideas are pitched or stories are created, there's the editorial meeting in the morning, there's a rundown of the news of the day. So what's the process at BuzzFeed for content creation? A lot of the ideas are so specific and niche and off the wall. I'm just curious about the content creation process. Yeah, I mean I guess we, you know, I think we have some of the normal newsroom conventions. You know, we have meetings, we brainstorm, we have run, a rundown and Edit, and, and every nothing goes up without you know with very occasional exceptions without having been seen by an editor or by somebody else and you know worked on collaboratively. The thing that I think is different from um, a normal news organization is we don't have a we, I don't really see us having limited space or like there's no I mean the, the entire internet is the space and so there isn't I mean I think a lot of people at publications worry a ton about the mix like oh God we had a story about rabbits today we can't have another tomorrow or whatever or, or about you know Barack Obama or whatever it is and I think like you know our, my view is just like it's a big internet people who are coming to our site are also seeing stuff all over and we just should be and, and I think the space that we need to think about filling is very is like the online conversation broadly not our website narrowly Can you all talk a little bit about how you monetize your different types of audience? So those who are coming for Ben's hard-hitting news versus those who are coming for, you know, cat and rabbit photos. Um, I would assume that the former is more valuable. Yeah, I guess I would say they're. A bit, I think they're the same people. Although yeah. I mean, I, well, I think that well, they're overlapping sets. I think the set of people who care about animals includes people who care about politics but not vice versa, and it's not entirely vice versa. But yeah, how do you monetize them? Yeah, so, so Ben's editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed, so he oversees all the content on BuzzFeed, um, not just hard-hitting political stuff, but, uh, but you know, with, with an amazing team of, 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 of editors like Scott Lamb and Dory Shafir and, and, and others. Um, and <clears throat> what we found is that um, the audience of BuzzFeed, when we were just doing fun, entertaining kind of content and we didn't have any reporting, what tended to be um, young, urban, cosmopolitan, savvy people who liked eclectic things from all different parts of culture. Um, and so when we started, and, and those, are, those people actually care about news, actually care about you know, reporting, actually care about all these other things that, that, that we're launching. So, um, and in fact, people prefer to have a mix of all these different types of content together. So when we do surveys of our users, they say we love the mix of content. Like we don't want to just go to a, a site that's only serious and we don't want to go to a site that's only humor. Um, and so I think that um, people who are curious and broadly interested in things um, tend to like sites like BuzzFeed. And by the way, they tend to like things like Facebook and Twitter. Because if you go to Facebook, you have the cute animal thing next to the Arab Spring, next to your friend getting drunk, next to you know a long form thing in the New York Times. So that's really how media is consumed now. All this stuff gets mixed together, and it's a more enjoyable way to consume media. And we're just doing it at the source as a publisher instead of just ceding that entirely to the social networks. I, you said you were building a social video studio in LA. What's the BuzzFeed spin or philosophy on video? Um, so video is, is, is led by Zay Frank, who's one of the early pioneers in web video. Um, who, with um, a very small team, is already north of 65 million views a month in video. Um, and we haven't even fully integrated into BuzzFeed's site yet, so it's been, been driven largely by uh, sharing of the videos on YouTube. We found um, that you know, short, entertaining videos that have a lot of the qualities of BuzzFeed content 
uh, buzz, you know, on the site, which is you know, having emotional resonance, having humor, um, having um, something tying to identity so that there's, when you're sharing them, it tells the world something about yourself, um, have all really translated well to video, and our video views are growing incredibly fast. Um, and in addition, um, we've seen that, that people are watching their video on videos on mobile at a rate that kind of surprised me, actually, and that the, the peak viewing time for video is during prime time. So people are actually on their couch uh, or in their bed with their laptop, you know, watching a show, maybe on Netflix or, or on television. And then when things are boring, they're watching on their mobile device uh, BuzzFeed videos uh, and so, uh, or during commercials or, or, or whatever. So we're seeing really interesting behavior uh, as pe uh, of, in terms of how people are consuming, consuming video um, on BuzzFeed. Um, and it's going to be a big initiative. We haven't even finished our space yet, and it's already becoming something that is generating several or a dozen million view plus uh, videos a month. Hi. So I was uh, interested in sort of you were talking about Boston and the shitstorm of information and people coming to your site for it. And how do you separate out the sort of, I mean, influx of social data and report and your process are sort of sorting out the shit from the truth in that process, especially like stuff like CNN reporting arrests and... Right, I mean, the, pro I mean, the problem with those stories, like, I don't know, it's, it's so easy to pick on CNN or to, on anybody in those situations, but like, it's incredibly hard because you have good law enforcement sources who are themselves confused and are getting, you know, reports from their, their subordinates that are wrong. Um, so there's always, in the, in the early hours of a big crime, all sorts of confusing, chaotic reports. I mean, I think basically that what you can do is, is I mean, there are times when there's stuff getting kicked around on the web, like is this J J uh, Jokar Sarnayev's Twitter account, where if you're fairly sophisticated, and where a lot of the reporters covering the story are maybe law enforcement reporters who, who wouldn't think to, who wouldn't totally know how to figure out if that is his account, like by seeing that, the, that his photo was on it in a Google, in a cache page from before he was, you know, famous. Or, um, and by linking things that are circulating on the web up to, to reality, by like calling his friends and saying, hey, is this his Twitter account? Um, but a lot of that first wave of stuff is on YouTube. When you, when, you know, whenever there's somebody who pops into the news, is, you know, what, what, what comes out first. And often, you know, these are now not minor things, but big pieces of their identity. Are their Twitter page, their Facebook, or in this case, Contacta page, the, um, you know, their LinkedIn page, whatever it is. So I mean, I think it's about trying to take you know, sophistication about how those platforms work, about whether like, you know, I think a lot of people, there was, there was a YouTube video actually where he had commented on it, but I think people who didn't totally understand how comment threading works on YouTube thought that, it, that he was the guy in the video. And that was, I mean, so like it's about sort of partly like just be understanding how these platforms work. And then also using kind of very traditional reporting tools, picking up the phone, trying to tie them back to reality. But also just acknowledging that it's going to be total chaos and just trying to like guide your readers through it as best you can. I think we're uh, pretty much out of time here. Thank you guys right. so much. Thanks so much.